Hello, Billy Reeves here. Welcome to the K-Scope podcast number 148. Hope you're well. Thanks for your company. Coming up, a chinwag with Ed Wynn from the legendary Osric Tentacles about many things. A remix from Envy of None. News and clips from Manson's Paul Draper, Tangerine Dream and the K-Scope sample of Volume 10, Jonathan Halton, Lunatic Soul. Before we have our conversation with Ed Wynn, though, this from Tesseract is vocalist Daniel Tompkins. Dan's released two new singles, Frenzy and The Abyss, uh, to celebrate his collaboration with the Alpha Delta Brewery uh, to launch his own craft beer. Little taster of the album he's working on with Mac Christensen and Chimp Spanner. This then, The Abyss. Daniel Tompkins, The Abyss. Now, Osric Tentacles legendary frontman Ed Wynn has a new album out on K-Scope with his chum Grey Vandaloo. It's entitled Tumbling Through the Floativerse. Before we have a good old chinwag with Ed, let's hear Infinity Curtains.
Edwin with his friend Grey of Vandaloo alongside. That's the final passage of a track entitled Infinity Curtains from Tumbling Through the Floaty Verse. Very recently, I had the great honour and privilege of having a good old chinwag with Mr Edwin, myself in Middlesex, himself way up there in Scotland. So congratulations on the record, a new Edwin LP just as midsummer hits was that deliberate no it seems to be a perfect timing really and uh yeah i was happy to see that out at last it's been a while you know been making it and polishing it for about a year and a half now so yeah was that deliberate did you did you think of it as a summer record i always imagined it i thought in fact it might have been coming out the previous summer but then there was another record came out instead so we sort of put this one on hold for a bit but yeah no it's, it's got a very summery kind of sound to it it seems and so it's i'm glad that it's managed to come out at this time is that frustrating guy i can't imagine putting a record back by a whole year because i mean it must take a year to do it well you see it was i, I sort of made it at the same time as i made the last osric album um sort oh. of in between times to keep myself sane you know and so in a way, the uh, the other one kind of overshadowed this, and so it sort of went very much into the background for a few months, you know. Uh, so therefore, no, it wasn't frustrating, really. It was kind of a nice surprise to suddenly think, oh, hang on a minute, there's this album. And I sort of mentioned to the record company that there is this pretty much finished record, and do they want to do anything with it? And they said, yes, please. So I thought, well, OK, I'll finish this off and see what they think, you know. I mean, because Tony Paris at Payscope is our mutual friend, of course. I, I don't think I've known him quite as long as you have but I've known him a long time and he he's so evangelical about you and, and he seems to be on a one-man mission to return you or place you in a very high pantheon of British pop music is that something you're comfortable with <laughs> eventually it might be nice after all these many many years of hacking away at it yeah it'd be fun but um you know Whatever, either way, you know, see, the thing is with me is I'm very happy either way, you know, I mean, whether I'm successful at this or not, I'm still going to keep doing it because it's all I can manage to keep doing, really, you know. Um, that's, well, that's interesting. So that how would you how would you gauge success? Because I would say that you have been and continue to be successful doing what you're doing, surely. Yeah, I mean, for me, success is, is, is to be comfortable, you know, really have a roof and a bit of food and the friends and family and close people all safe it's good enough for success for me you know it's nice to see actually kind of musicians being spoken about as key workers you know and and, and it's interesting that you know many of them have second jobs and how difficult it is to tour now i mean have you you know are, you know are you sort of like living in your in a sort of edwin world or have you been kind of touched by that i mean obviously you've been touched by the pandemic a little bit, yeah, but I mean, my, my version of the pandemic was the fact that, thankfully, Tony, again, at Snapper, said, look, it's okay, you make an album and, and it'll be fine, you know, so that was my pandemic experience. Uh, so, um, so after that, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know, really, it's, no, pretty much the bubble retained, and it's the same, yeah, yeah, the blue bubble is still intact, and uh, it feels pretty much the same as it always has, really. Yeah. Pretty much everybody that I've come across in doing 148 podcasts for K-Scope basically owns the means of production. Whereas, you know, when I was a lad, you know, you would have to go to a record company, they'd be the venture capitalist, you would have to hire studios, people would talk about warm fuzz and flange. and But you've, but you've pretty much been doing that for a long time. Well, yeah, it used to frustrate me early on when I used to do bits of music for people in studios and I'd see them all there sort of playing about with all these toys and I very much wanted to get my hands on it, you know. And I, <laughs> <laughs> on the knobs. Yeah, you know, and having, I was sort of not allowed to play with them, but I just thought, well, that looks great, you know, and so I thought, well, somehow I'm going to try and wangle this so that I can do this and, and, and not listen to anybody else's ideas and have fun with it myself, you know. And it's been a slow learning life journey, learning how to get finer and finer details and, and closer to what I want to have on yes, the I, I, I always suspected that so much of that kind of argo was bullshit. It's extraordinary, really, actually, because it has really shrunk. I mean, you know, what used to be a room full of huge boxes with a recording machine the size of a washing machine, um, now is like the, it's the whole the entire thing is like in something the size of a Tintin book now. It's ridiculous. It's, uh, Amazing, I love it. It's good, you can carry it. And it's, it's at last, there's the studio in the pocket. A few years ago, for the first time, I saw somebody basically producing their album on the tube. You know, they had a laptop and they were clearly doing some beats. 
you know, and editing them. And it was really, you know, it was really inspiring. Weather-wise, though, it must be a bit of a double-edged sword because the, you know, the warm weather has put, um, you know, the climate catastrophe front and centre, which has been interesting to hear that people are actually, you know, people are actually talking about it. Although, of course, inevitably it's turned into a typical English binary argument, but at least people are speaking about it, I guess. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's been pretty, pretty... Um... I mean, I must say, it's been pretty nice up here, actually, in Scotland. It's quite a rare treat to get sun like this. So, you know, but I've, I gather it's been a little bit sort of <laughs> suspiciously weirdly hot. Very much. So who's this, who's this other fella that's on the record? How come he gets a credit? Well, this is Grey, my friend Grey. Um, he's, uh, he has his own world, which is called, he called his band is called Grace Rooms. And the reason he calls it that is because his name is Grey, short for Gregory, which is in, in, but he's from Holland, and he says these are Grey's rooms, his little tunes that he makes. <laughs> and um, he's, he was a big fan of Osric's for a long time, and uh, we played a gig in Holland, and his band was supporting us, and then as soon as they started, me and Silas just ran down there and said, who's this, what the... And um, since then, heard his CDs and, and got to know him, Obviously, it's quite influenced what he does from from the sort of synthesis and stuff that I do, but with his own very happy vibe in there of his own making, you know, a, alongside his little Osricky influence. And so, you know, eventually I got to know him. I mean, he came to a gig, and I got on very well with him. You know, he was hilarious, nice, humorous, very very nice guy. You know, and uh, eventually decided to try a tune or two you know and uh, it seemed to work very well you know and he... so when so when so when did he get involved in floatyverse then was he was he in at the in at the ground floor as it were or did you think do you know what i need gray on this no no it was definitely we decided to sort of think well let's let's make something there was a yeah there was a concert a couple of three years ago at cosfest festival um where i needed um silas couldn't help me with this gig i was doing so I had to get Grey in to come and uh, be there on synth as well. So we had a great time there. Met each other properly, musically and, and other stuff, because we had to rehearse and stuff. Then, you know, eventually thought, well, you know, this is really fun. And, and is that all we're going to do or should we do some more? And I said, well, come over and we'll do some stuff in the studio. Come and play about. And uh, suddenly at the end of that, we had sort of six starting points, six backing tracks after wow. about three days. And it was like, OK, well, it's very easy. And um, eventually it sort of started sounding like a very completed thing. And we thought, well, then the Osric album came out, so we had to stop for a bit. And then that calmed down. We brought this one out. And, uh, yeah. So, so, so maybe, it's, maybe, that's, maybe that's what I'm sensing then. Maybe I'm sensing his kind of summery vibes then when I'm thinking. Because as you say, it's quite a happy record. I mean, I always expect your records to be happy, but there is, there is something, it bounces. Well, no, the, point being, the, the, the point being that we were... Um, in the studio together, very much enjoying being very silly on synthesizers and back to around having fun, you know. Yeah. And for me, it was like, okay, well, this doesn't actually have to be Osric-y, so I can just let's just have it for fun. Yeah, yeah, it's funky, it's funky, man. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it bounces about. <laughs> it's it, but this, of course, is hugely disappointing because I do, you know, I want I want my artists to be at each other's throats. You know, I, don't, I can't. You can't create. Surely, you can't create great art without some sort of terrible conflict. Please tell me a, about a, a track or a passage of a track that nearly didn't make it because you were oh, rowing. And the, well, no, there was a couple of um, tracks which were nothing to do with rowing. We don't know how to do that. Really, we're too spaced out to do that sort of thing. <laughs> but there, there were a couple which didn't make it because uh, we thought they were a bit boring or something. Maybe we, we, we. I think we recorded seven backing tracks and we got five tracks out of it so that's not a bad average really ah, so does it start with a groove yeah well gray is a drummer you see yeah um, ah. and i have an electric kit here which i can record midi drums with so what we were doing i was getting my sense all clonking away nicely and he'd suddenly go right there we go wait a minute let me go to the kit and i just push record and uh, off it goes you know and he's very very quick like this so for those that for those that don't know then explain what midi means so he's bashing away on the kit and you can make him sound like ringo or nico mcbain <laughs> not quite <laughs> not quite um midi means that you can play the drums on a midi kit which sends impulses from the pads on the drum kit through to my computer which then triggers drum sounds to sound like a drum kit um so in a way it's like getting a very nice huge uh, production drum kit sound without having to have all that stuff and just have him sort of because mm. whenever whenever I see those midi kits that they look really flimsy 
They look as though they would sort of like fall apart if you hit them, but they must be quite sturdy then, obviously. Yeah, they, they do collapse occasionally, yeah, when the drum All oh, right, good. I'm glad you... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's oh, an, glad. What, the annoying thing is when a drummer isn't used to these things and they're expecting it to respond like a real drum kit. Yeah, so they, exactly. So they smack the living crap out of the thing, <laughs> trying to get it louder. And I, I'm trying to say, no, be, be gentle on this poor little electronic <laughs> little... Oh, please, please tell me that you have a... What, what would be the MIDI impulses of the whole thing falling to bits? That must sound amazing. Well, yeah, it goes up to 127, and you might get a couple of 128s there if you... Because if... <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've often, you know, because I've often fantasised about, um, you know, what, a, you know, literally a drum and a drum kit being kicked down the stairs would sound. It's an old cliche from my time. If someone gets too busy or out of time, it sounds like the drummer's being kicked down the stairs. I would really love to hear that a MIDI version of that. Well, what I find happens is that when a drummer is doing drum fills going round the toms and it's not quite tight enough, it sounds like someone emptying a sack of potatoes over the kit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Okay. Well, that would now, well, so that's my point where it brings the conversation full circle then, isn't it? Because if you can make a MIDI kit sound, literally, actually sound like someone yeah. tipping out a... a, a a bag of spice, or of course, uh, vice versa. So, what's what's what happens in the future then? Where you know, where, where where's your head at when it comes to if I if I say the words Osric tentacles, yes. what does that what does that immediately spark in you? Is well, it... it makes me look at it makes me look at my computer and realise that I've got pretty much an entire Osric album almost finished already. Mm -hmm. Which is a... So how do you so how do you know it's going to be an Ostrix album and how do you know it's going to be an Ed album? Well, it's, it just depends what's required at the time, really. If if there's one, there's there's three things: there's Osric and there's an Ed album, and there's also this Nodin's Ictus, Ooh. which is a slightly more ambient version of the whole same Ooh. thing. Okay, expect, okay, define ambient. Oh, um, less. I mean, not ambient, literally, but less in less heavy, less rocky, basically. There's oh, okay. More ethereal, less rocky. So. Um, yeah, there's, so there's three places the tracks can go, and depending on their nature or what's required, I can sort of bend them towards what's required, really. Ah, is it compartmentalising or just being tidy? It's a very easy thing to start a piece of music, but it's a very, very difficult thing to finish. <laughs> well, there's no one telling you to stop, is there? No, well, not really. That's the trouble. Somebody once said something like, uh, what was it? Art is never finished. It's only abandoned. I thought of you a lot. I would think about you a lot all the time, of course. But I thought about you a lot with the, let's see, the return to uh, Her Majesty's BBC of the Glastonbury Festival this year. From what I saw, it looked very good. You know, I mean, I always get a slight uh, weird feeling when I see it because I think, well, you know, that's great. I wish kind of that I was there a little bit. <laughs> I get sort of jealous seeing them all sort of like. Because how's it how's it changed over the years? Well, um, they've become obviously more corporate and more 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 rules. You know, when I when the first festivals I went to was, was Stonehenge Festival actually, and I just got in this sort of <clears throat> truck and about this truck with these people, and I didn't know what was going on. They just said, "Look, hey, okay, we're going to this festival." I said, "Okay, yeah, where's the entrance?" They said, "Well, it's whenever you know, whatever." And then we just drove in there, no tickets, nothing, and just sort of set up a camp and uh, started playing music. And that was easy enough. And then Glastonbury used to be quite smaller, a bit more gentle. And uh, yeah. I remember one year there was this, there was a sort of outside outside the festival, a sort of free version of Glastonbury. A little we played there a couple of times. That was very nice. Good friends and stuff with the stage. But yeah, and then after that, you know, it's when we've played there, it's been a very commercial thing, and we've gone into this huge stage. I guess that, I, I guess I'm going to be the devil's advocate here because I guess that has advantages you know it's interesting you say rules rather than saying you know it's more disciplined i mean you know rules suggests bad 
Are you talking? Um, and, and obviously, that you know, people don't get paid possibly as much as they should be. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, you have to when you have that many people around. You've got to have some some kind of order, some kind of law and order, really. Yeah. You, you, you know, when, when we were going to Stonehenge in the, in the ages ago, you know, it was like literally you just started barge your way through the police and you just say, "Sorry, mate, we're, we're going this way and that's what we're doing." And this is where I'm going to camp. I've got my fireplace here. I'm going to put my generator there and a drum kit and start wow. playing music and then, you know, just in the field in front of our van, you know, wherever we were. It was really fun. We had a thing once um, we, when we played the, the, the main stage there one time. Um, the next month, Mike Levis had an actual little small show he put on for the locals in um, Bilton. And it was a little thing with a uh, marquee and stuff. And we, we invited us to go and play there. It was really nice, a little sort of village gathering. And we to say thank you, you know, for putting up with the insanity of having all these people. Yeah, clever. Yeah, because it's, it's in the worst place. It couldn't be in a worse place to get to. It's a tricky, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's extraordinary. <laughs> Yeah, that road is very much like a long... He's middle of nowhere. What's, what's he like, Avis? He was very pleasant when I saw him. It was a while ago now. It was probably 10 years ago. But he's nice. He's a very nice, very, very, you know, quite sort of humble, really. And, uh, yeah, good fun. He called his... I think he's got... Or he used to have a cat called Osric, which was always interesting. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> what an honour. Yeah, so what's the, what's the worst festival? I'm not really sure, you know, to be honest. They're all so very, very different. The ones I enjoy are the ones with the nice people. If there's too much queuing and messing about and uh, arrogance involved, it doesn't interest me so much. Yeah, I like it when you get there and there's a smiling face and say, hello, right here, yeah, yeah, it's all very easy and come here, you know. Not like, tell me what, not tell me which kind of wristbands I've got and that I've got the wrong ones and I'm in the wrong place and, and sorry, mate, no, 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 you know. Do you know what? It's very hard, hard for me to find anything wrong with any of it, really, because I'm very blessed. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Damn, I thought I had you there. No, I'm really sorry. I can't think of anything negative about it at the moment. You know, is there any sort of like current groups that you listen to? You know, how, how much do you stay in touch? Is there anything that you dig from the from the current music scene? Ooh, not on a commercial level, really, that I know of. I hear tunes. I don't, I don't really get a chance to know what they are, though, you know. Often I hear stuff and it kind of comes and goes and and I think well what was that and by then you're on the next track and someone the attention span thing is a bit quick these days for you just sit down and actually enjoy yeah, that's that. True, yeah. you know? Isn't there isn't there isn't there a chum of yours that get, have you got chums that would go hey man dig this Yeah but you, they come up with some really weird stuff though they don't give me normal music at all nothing current <laughs> <laughs> Right okay well define normal music Well I don't know stuff that you might put on the radio and it sounds like every other track that you've ever heard and it's all I don't know So it, uh, it's so these chums are trying to flip your wig Yeah a little bit I mean you know do they succeed? <laughs> yeah, yeah, occasionally, yeah. I, I get some weird stuff played to me by people. I, so people are like a filter and they sort of find the good bits and give me that because I have problems with quite a lot of music. I'm, I'm very, very fussy. I'm not a very nice person to play tunes to, <laughs> unless you're the person who made the tune, in which case I'll be very nice to you. <laughs> well, I guess that, yeah, I guess that must be tricky if it's your... If it's because, like I say, when I did it really, really briefly professionally, I felt as though it had let light into magic a little bit. I started yeah. to analyse stuff and I lost, and that's why I stopped doing it. Eight months. And uh -huh. I thought, I'm just not, I, I'm not enjoy. I've lost, you know, my hobby has become my job. So I've lost yeah. that. Would, would that be, would that be something that you've experienced? Not really, because I mean, music for me is very much, I mean, it sounds weird, but music really is pretty much what I do all the time, really. Okay. It's like living and breathing for me. It's I kind of wow. I wake up with the second cup of tea. I'm in here in the studio, just wow. seeing seeing what tunes come along, and then at some point I have to cook food and eat, and then a bit more wow. and sleep every day. Do you keep Do you keep a disciplined timetable? Yeah, not deliberately, but I'm up early. -ish, you know, I'm up early, um, sort of normally in the studio by nine thirty in the morning. Having got up at about eight o'clock, half seven. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's fairly fairly good, really. You eat very very um, nice, healthy food. Um, don't go too mental and uh... so what's next then what so we got we got this albums out there is there going to be any more singles pulled off it are you are you and Gray going to play live I think well live would be really nice we haven't been offered it yet but um, maybe it will come along you know the album's only been out a couple of days people are just getting used yeah. to it um, yeah. sure yeah I mean you know uh, what is next just uh, 
gigs. We've got um, quite a lot of festival gigs we're doing. Me and Silas doing our little solo spot. Okay, you're Os- Osric Electronica. At the moment, yeah, until the... How's that, how's that been going? Very good, very easy and good and, and much fun had by all. Um, people are surprised at what it sounds like, you know, coming on and going, what is all this nonsense about electronic? And then by the time they get to the track kick mark or something like this, they're flying and, and think, okay, all is right, this, this, I hear so, uh, over the years I've heard so much where I've thought they've either, they've got that from the Osterix. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, that groovy 16s thing, that arpeggiated thing, followed by... You know, the flipping out on the guitar. It's, it, your music sounds really fresh. I don't know whether it's just gone full circle. <laughs> maybe, maybe. It has, yeah. 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 But what is it? So, big question to finish there. What is the future? I mean, post pandemic. If if there is ever going to be post pandemic, you know, p- perhaps musicians are being, um, you know, more treasured now. Uh, but at the no, same token, it's more difficult to tour. You know, uh, you know, people doing concerts online, which has been interesting because you can connect with fans all over the world you know where do you see the future of it going well we tried a couple of those online gigs um, during the pandemic which was massively um stressful actually but ended up being quite okay in the end that was fun I've, i'd always wanted to do it i know I've, I've now done that so i don't really feel particularly to do that because it's a lot of work but but um you know gigs gigs and um stuff um, see see where they let us go you know i mean no there's a there's, there's a thirst for it i think there certainly is, yeah. But I guess that you know the, the you know the extra money that it costs now is passed on to the consumer, perhaps that it's getting quite expensive to do to do these things. It is, yeah. I and mean, hopefully the fees will go up. And unfortunately, <laughs> part, yeah, pass, part it, pass it on to the consumer. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean you know we did. Life is getting more expensive, so therefore you know we have to we're going to have to charge a little more for what we do. But then hopefully there's more. It's a reward, and maybe it's more special because it's a rare thing, and then maybe it costs a little more like a rare. Yeah, yeah, people should take it for fucking granted, Matt. Yep, yeah, sure.
Oily Voice. And before that, you heard a little bit of Seen the Sun. And before that, Infinity Curtains. Edwin Grey Vandaloo from Tumbling Through the Floatyverse, which is out now. My thanks to Ed for his time. That was good fun. Right, some clips of hits you mustn't miss. First up, Envy of None, more of whom later, a seven-inch single released to raise money for the UNHCR for their Ukraine emergency response. Last few copies still available from visionmerch.com. This is the B-side of the seven, and you'll also find this track on the bonus disc of the deluxe version of the Envy of None album. This is a bit of You'll Be Sorry. You'll be sorry. Draper of Manson, Attack of the Grey Lantern, live at Ritz, is coming out on the 5th of August, available to pre-order on CD for the first time. Here's a bit of The Chad Who Loved Me. Stupper Slither of Machu Picchu from the album of the same name by Tangerine Dream. Reissue now available on LP and CD. Finally, from K-Scope Volume 10 Sampler, first a bit of Jonathan Hall 10, then Lunatic Soul, The Mountain, followed by The Fountain.
Payscope Volume 10 Sampler is now available to hear on all digital streaming platforms. Huge congratulations, I think, are in order to Kscope alumni Porcupine Tree on getting to number two in the official UK charts with closure continuation. To celebrate, we're offering 20% off of their catalogue on Bandcamp, along with Stephen Wilson, Gavin Harrison, and Richard Barbieri related projects. All you've got to do is use PT20 at checkout. And in the very near future, a long chat with Colin Edwin, formerly of Porcupine Tree, about his current musical project and his thoughts on not being involved with Porcupine Tree going forward. I'm going to end this podcast with something a little bit special. Envy of None. The self-titled album is out now. Envy of None being Alf Annibalini, the studio avatar, Maya Wynn, vocalist, bass player Andy Curran, and on guitar, Alex Lifeson, probably most famous for being in Rush. There's a visualizer video on our YouTube and social channels for this. This is Dumb, the Der Dummkopf remix. Envy of none. Ta-da.